This video is sponsored by LearnSQL.com. In the course of working on any coding project, you will run into multiple instances where your code doesn't work the way you want it to. It may not compile and give you some weird cryptic message. It may compile and run, but produce a different outcome from what you were expecting, or it may run and crash for mysterious reasons. In this video, I will explain how to effectively debug your code when you find yourself in situations like that, so you can be an efficient developer, saving you time and headaches in the long run. Let's get into it. So the first thing people usually do when their program doesn't work is to take out or modify the most written chunk of code that they've written. In most cases, this works perfectly fine. You may have forgotten a return statement or forgot to indent a line or forgot a semicolon, some of that. In cases where this doesn't work, the first step should be to identify the specific issue you have and the main place to look at that is the stack trace. The stack trace is a report that provides information about the code subroutine. It shows a list of method calls that the application was in the middle of when the error happened, giving you the exact line and the method where the error occurred. Every programming language has one, and they look very similar. It's the first place you should look at when debugging. Learning how to read it is very important, so let's take a look. So this is the stack trace. I ran the Python script here, so the RFID card listener, and you can see there was an error. It's telling me exactly where the error was, which is saying, hey, from Spotify, um, import this in line three here. There was an error in this specific method here. So if I want to find this, if you have VS Code, I can then hold shift and then go here. So it's telling me exactly where the error was. This is an example of a stack trace in Python. I'm going to show an example of a stack trace in a different language. So this is an example of a stack trace in a different language, specifically Laravel PHP. For Laravel, the stack trace is found in the laravel.log file, and this is the way it is for some programming languages. But you can see that the general idea is the same. It tells you exactly what the error is, and it tells you where the error is specifically. So if I scroll down, I want to find a specific one. Yes. So in this case, um, it's telling me exactly where the error is. It's saying, hey, there's an error here in this specific file at this specific line in that place. So most of the time, if you have any errors, the stack trace is the best place to go look at what the specific error is. Back to our Python error. Say you get an error like this. The next step is to try to understand the error and group it into one of four categories. Is it a compilation error? Is it a runtime or a program crash? Is it an infinite loop or is it a logical error? Debugging the error will look different depending on which category it falls into. Let's start with the first, the compilation error. Compilation error simply means the program isn't compiling, meaning the compiler can't build the program. Whenever you write a program, before the program can run, the compiler has to translate your code from the programming language you wrote it in into machine-readable code, also known as executables. The compile error happens when the compiler tries to translate the code you wrote, but there is an issue. 9 out of 10 times, it's usually a syntax issue. Maybe you forgot a curly bracket or you've defined a variable twice, or a mismatch bracket. Your IDE usually catches errors like this and warns you before you compile the code, as seen in this instance here. So our IDE is telling us, hey, we're expecting this. The other type of error is the runtime error. This happens when the program compiles, but an error occurs during execution of the program. Perhaps you defined a variable that you expected to have a value at a specific point during the execution, but that value was null, and hence, you're getting an error. Let me show you an example. This is a quick example of a program that I just wrote. All it does is it asks the user for a number. When the user enters the number, it then divides four by that number and prints the result. So if we run it, it'll ask us for a number. I can then input the number four and it prints the result as 1.0. Say I run it again, but rather than entering four, I enter zero. We get an error here saying zero division error. This is a runtime error because what happened was the program was expecting me to enter a number that's not zero. And what happened was I entered a number that's zero. And as you know, you can divide a number by zero. It's something the program isn't expecting, but it happens during the run of the program. There is no syntax issue. Everything looks good. The logic looks good. It's just an error that happened while the program was executing because of something we didn't account for. Both compilation errors and runtime errors are usually easy to fix. The stack trace tells you exactly what the issue is and where to fix it. And sometimes, it also tells you how to fix it. In this case, it's telling us exactly what the issue is. It's saying zero division error, meaning, hey, you know, you can divide by zero. If that information isn't helpful or is confusing, you can and should always copy the exact error message that you're getting and Google it. So in this case, the error message would be division by zero. And I will just go to Google and just Google the error message. And most of the time, 
it tells you exactly what the error is. You're not the only one that has had that problem in the past. Often, the solution already exists on the holy grail of sites, Stack Overflow. When reading through the solution, something like this, try and read the whole post. Yes, it'll take time, but you have to read the whole post. Many people, including myself, just try to find the code snippet that fixes our problem and copy it, paste it, and move on. But we don't understand the context or understand why the code snippet solves the problem. The person giving you the answer could have just written the code snippet, but there's a reason why they dropped an explanation here and gave multiple instances. They are knowledgeable about the topic and they are sharing it with you. They may be dropping what took them years to learn into a paragraph for you to consume and read in 5 to 10 minutes. Some popular problems have history behind them and reading the paragraph gives you context as to how the problem started and the solution that people came up with. This is knowledge that will help you solve more bugs in the future. The next two types of errors usually can't be solved by googling them and they require using a specific tool. Before we get into them, a quick word from the sponsor of this video, LearnSQL.com. When you strip away all the programming languages and the fancy frameworks, at its core, programming is mostly about data. Getting data, storing it in a database, interpreting and manipulating it to get insights or displaying it to users. As a developer, having some database knowledge is vital because your applications will almost always use data and knowing how to store it is essential. This is where LearnSQL.com can help. They offer a variety of courses to learn SQL, which is the most popular and the de facto database programming language. They provide full-length courses for you to learn SQL in the variety it comes in. They also have courses of varying experience level, learning SQL from A to Z, learning only the fundamentals or learning everything you need to be a database administrator, which is a legit tech career and much more. If you know some SQL and want to practice or sharpen your skills, they have practice courses with an inbuilt web-based text editor, so all the work can be done from the comfort of your browser. Go check out LearnSQL today using the link below and thank you to LearnSQL for sponsoring this video. Now back to the video. The next two categories of bugs are the infinite loop bug and the logic error. In the infinite loop bug, the program compiles and runs but nothing happens. This may be because you have some logic somewhere causing an infinite loop or something similar to that. In the logic error bug, the program runs and compiles, however, it's not doing what you want it to. It's producing the wrong output or a different outcome from what is expected. Let's take a look at an example. We're back to the Spotify to Apple Music project. All this project is supposed to do is play a Spotify playlist based on the data that I've passed here. So it's supposed to decode a cab's ID and map it to a Spotify playlist, which comes from this file right here. And so based on this, it should come in here, grab the data and then play the Spotify playlist. This is the context URI. What should happen is when I run it for this ID, it should play the specific ID for this album, which is we're all alone in this together by Dave. It should start playing the album. But as you can see, when I run the code and I press enter, nothing happens. So it's not playing the album. For both errors, you just can't Google them because they are very case specific. It'll be hard for you to go to Google and type, my program isn't working without giving specific error message. You can ask on Stack Overflow, but I would say that as a last resort because it might take some time for you to get an answer. You will have to give a lot of detail and there will be a lot of follow-up questions from people asking you what the purpose of the program is and many more questions. The easiest and most efficient way to solve bugs like this is using a debugger tool. Most IDEs have them and the idea is to literally walk through the execution of the code step by step as it's executing to figure out what's going on. Let's take a look at an example. So in order to start debugging, the first thing we need to do is set our breakpoints. A breakpoint is pretty much a place in the code where you want the code to stop or pause so that you can then investigate. And in this case, I want it to stop here. So to set the breakpoint, you in VS Code at least and in most other IDEs, you pretty much click the line where you want the execution to stop. So it's here. Um, I can then go into here, which is this function, and then put another breakpoint inside anywhere here. No, the breakpoint has to be inside the method, so you can't put one here. Most of the time, the breakpoint should be in an expression. So I can put it here, I can put it here, I can put it in any of these places here. The next step for us to do is then to run the program, right? So I have to be in the main file, which is my the entry point to the program, which is RFID listener. So the same place where I would call a Python RFID listener from. And what I would then do is I've already set a breakpoint here and I've set one here. I can then go into the run and debug tool from here and click run and debug. As you can see, the program execution has started, right? 
Um, but what has happened is because we put a breakpoint here, the code has stopped here. It's not running, it's just stopped. From here, we can then inspect pretty much anything we want to inspect. We can see the call stack. We can see that the first place it went to was the module, which is the Python module, which is the file itself. And within that file, the next thing in the call stack it called was the main method. From here, there are a few things we can do. We can play with these controls up here. The first thing we can do is we can continue, meaning continue the execution of the program. If we continue and we don't have a next breakpoint, it'll just run through and just finish the execution of the program. But because we have a breakpoint in a separate area, what we can do is if we click continue, it'll then go and stop at our next breakpoint, right? If we click continue again, what will happen? You got it right. It'll stop at this next breakpoint. So continue pretty much just tells the program to continue its execution from where it stopped all the way till the next breakpoint. And if there's no next breakpoint, then it continues all the way to, to the end. So if I click this, it continues to the next breakpoint. Again, it didn't stop at this breakpoint because it's not an expression, right? It's This is a method, this is a print statement, it already printed, so it won't stop at it. So that's wrong, that's absolutely wrong. The reason why it didn't stop at this breakpoint was it was never going to go into that logical statement, right? So if type is play, then it goes into this if statement, right? But if type is never played, then during the execution of the program, it'll never go in here. It'll never stop at this breakpoint. Remember, it's going through the execution of the program. So it'll execute it like we are executing the program. And in this case, whether we have a breakpoint here or not, if it never has a reason to go in here, meaning if the logic doesn't dictate that it goes in here, then it won't go in here. And that's why it didn't go in there. That's a mistake. I've modified the code and added a few more lines just so we could explain the next tool we can play with. The next tool we can play with is the step over tool, which is this one right here. What it does is it steps over the function in the next line that you may not want to call. In this case, say we weren't going to debug the code card to action. What we can do is from this line, from our execution here, we can then step over this method. So we're here, we can then step over it, meaning it has executed what we wanted to execute, but we didn't step into that action. So we stepped over that method. Note, if you do have a breakpoint in the decode card to action method, then it'll have to step into it because again, it always stops at a breakpoint. So what the step over does in summary is it pretty much steps over a method call that you don't want to execute, right? So if you're not worried about debugging anything in that method, you could just step over the method. Otherwise, it'll step into that method for you to go see the code in that method. On the other side of the step over is the step into, which is the next method that we can work with, right? So what happens in the step into is, again, as the word suggests, it steps into the method. So if I am here and I step into print, into this print line that we have here, it's a print statement. So what it'll do is it'll execute the line and go to the next line. So if I execute it, if I, I press the step into, so it executed print previous and it's now in the code card. What then happens is from the code card to action method here, I can then step over the decode card to action method, meaning I don't want to go in, or I can step into it, meaning I want to go into that method and see what's happening in there. So if we click the, if we click step into, you can see that I'm now in the decode card to action method, even though I didn't have any breakpoint here. So if again, in this example, if I wanted to step into this method here, this get ID from JSON mapping, I can step into it and it takes me into that method, right? That's pretty much what the step into does. It mostly works for methods and then you click step in and it steps into that method. Similarly, the step out of, you guessed it right, steps out of a method. So I'm in the get ID JSON mapping and I'm in this first line now, for example. If I got in here by mistake and I don't want anything to do in here, I can simply click the step out of and you can see I'm now out of the get ID by JSON mapping instead of having to go through everything. And from there, I can just, you know, gradually keep stepping into, stepping, stepping over. From there, I can gradually keep stepping over and stepping over and stepping over everything. And that's exactly how that works. Now that we have a feel for how it works, let's try to use it to debug this problem that I'm having. I've set a breakpoint here, but I know exactly where the error is happening. I know it's happening in this method somewhere, and it's happening here because nothing is happening there. So what I can do is I can put my if statement here and try to figure out what's happening here. So when the thing execute, it stops here. So if I then go here and I run and debug this file, 
it stops exactly where I'm telling it to stop. From here, what then happens is I can then try to debug and figure out what's happening, right? Using the step into method or the step over, depending on the scenario. Here, I'll use the step over to see which of these paths it goes into to see whether it's you know going to play the music or it's going to control it's of type control or pretty much just see what's happening. Another good thing here is I can see the data that it's pulling from here. I can see my mapping. I can see what's in this mapping object right here on the side here. So it freezes the execution of the program so I can see everything that's happening. And so what's happening here is I can then, you know, click the step over and it didn't go into this if statement here because it wasn't play. And if I then click the step over, it's now right back outside this decode card to action, meaning there's a problem, meaning it didn't go into any of these if statements here, right? From there, I can then figure out, okay, why isn't it going into any of those if statements? Again, I'll run and I'll debug it and it'll stop here. From here, I can say, okay, what's actually happening here? What's the value of type in the mapping object? And I can go into the mapping object and I can see that, hey, type is PLA. So someone made a typographical error and it was supposed to be PLAY, but since it's not of type play, which I was expecting it to be, that didn't work. What's happening is it's not getting into this if statement and it's not getting into the next else if statement because, you know, it's not of type play. There's no, there's no logic to catch that error. Usually I would have put like a, the right thing would be to put an else statement here to just say, if it's of a type, we don't know, we throw an error or something like that. But the fix for this is relatively straightforward, right? I just go in here, type, you know, fix the typographical error. And from there, we can then see that, um, it plays the album that it's supposed to play right from me running it from here. So that's the general idea behind um, debugging. And yeah, this process takes a few more times to master and you'll have to do it a few times to get the hang of it. Getting good at programming or anything in general takes time. And a large part of it is doing it enough times so you can make multiple mistakes. Over time, we learn from our mistakes and we build an immune system against these bugs. As you write the code, things will start to look off and you'll catch the error before it even becomes a bug. That's all I have for you in this one. If you enjoyed the video, then consider subscribing. Be sure to follow me on TikTok and Instagram as well. I post videos like this, but in a much more condensed format. Thanks for watching and catch you on the next one. Until then, happy coding. Peace.